So good evening. Um, we have a standing room only crowd tonight. It's wonderful to see. I'm Josh Ginsberg. I'm the president of the Cary Institute. And I'd like to welcome you all to Friday nights at the Cary. Uh, it's a tradition that was started by my predecessor, and it's been a remarkable thing. Uh, I've greatly enjoyed it since I got here in September. The you know, Friday night lectures are always entertaining and educational and often fun. Um, so I welcome you. You'll see there are people here who have little things on the back of their chairs. Those are the benefits of being an Aldo Leopold Society member. The Aldo Leopold Society is a group of supporters of the Cary Institute, and the donations they make are critical for things like this and for some of the uh, outreach and education work we do. So if you'd like to ensure that at these sellout crowds, you have your very own seat, I urge you to become a member of the Alba Leopold Society. Um, I'd like to also let you know of some upcoming Friday night events. Uh, at the end of June, on um, Friday, June 26th, uh, Eric Sanderson of the Wildlife Conservation Society, where I was interned for 18 years, um, will be coming and talking about Manhattan. Uh, Eric wrote a book that was an ecological reconstruction of Manhattan uh, in the year that Henry Hudson sailed up the Hudson. And he is now working on a project, uh, I think nicknamed Wailikia, uh, which is about Manhattan in 400 years uh, and looking at the future. Um, Eric is always an incredibly engaging speaker and one of the most laterally minded human beings I know, so I think that's a great thing. Uh, and then on July 10th, so three weeks later, uh, we've learned not to do it back to back. It's just too much to ask of all of you. Um, we're going to have a talk that is also near and dear to my heart. Roland Keyes, who for many years was at the State Museum in Albany and is now at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, is going to talk about uh, one of my favorite topics, the recovery of carnivores in America, and particularly the recovery of predators in urban America. It's an incredibly timely talk as, as bears wander into parts of Westchester and Coyotes are finding a home in Riverside Drive a Park, and generally speaking, we think of predators as, as that which is rare and going extinct, when in fact, many predators are doing very well indeed. So that will be a wonderful talk. And then, sort of following a theme uh, that's been common to a lot of our outside activities this year, we're going to do a walk. Uh, Kelly Baird, who is an educational uh, staff member here is now an independent operator doing tours. It's going to be leading a walk on Wednesday, July 15th at 6 p.m., uh, which will focus on, it's an interpretive walk, focusing on the invasive species uh, that surround us. Um, and then there are other things, but I'll wait to tell you about those till next month. So it is a pleasure always to introduce a speaker uh, who is a member of staff. Rick Osfeld um, is one of the nations and probably the world's experts on Lyme disease. Uh, Rick came to the Kerry Institute rather late in the game, uh, 1990. He's only been here 25 years. Um, you will know from having listened to talks about other staff that the Institute was founded in, in 1983, and, and many of the people came in the, in the years following that. So Rick was, was at the tail end of the first wave of Kerry scientists. Um, his first review uh, on Lyme disease was in 95. <coughs> Four? Yeah, something like that. Uh, and uh, so he has been working on this issue since it was not the issue it is now. And I think his approach you know, reflects a considered ecosystems approach to understanding both the causes of the disease and also how we would manage it. Uh, Rick was originally from California and did his undergraduate degree. I get them mixed up and I want to get the order right. Undergraduate at Santa Cruz and then his PhD at Berkeley. Uh, he then moved east and, and, and stayed on this coast, for which we are extremely grateful. Um, I'd like to thank him for, for taking the time tonight. It's an extra duty for our staff, and it's always uh, important for them to talk to you about what we do here at the Cary Institute. So, Rick. Yeah. <laughs> 
this up. So, what I'm going to do this evening is describe our, our, our research program in my lab here at the Cary Institute. Some very recent results and some results dating back more than 20 years. Most of this research has been done very locally, and I will focus on the local dynamics of tick-borne disease. We've been working largely on the grounds or near the grounds of this institute, so the forests and fields surrounding where you sit right now is our research laboratory. Um, and we also work elsewhere in Dutchess County, as I'll show you as we move, move forward. So this is a very local set of data that I'm going to be telling you about, and a, a, an understanding of tick-borne disease risk that comes from our local studies. But I want to place it in a global perspective. And the global perspective is that we live in an age of emerging infectious diseases. So these authors, a few years ago, published a paper in a leading journal called Nature that tallied the number of emerging infectious diseases of humans that have been described just since 1940 or so. And they came up with what I find an astonishing number, 335 infectious diseases of humans that have emerged. And what that means is they're either brand new to science, we never knew they existed, or they've suddenly gotten much worse, causing epidemics or pandemics, or they've suddenly appeared in a brand new area where they were never found before. So that's the definition of an emerging infectious disease. You can see from this slide that these emerging infectious diseases of people are not something that occur in faraway exotic places like the tropics of Africa or, or South America, at least in this part of the world. Actually, most of them occur in our backyard, in temperate North America and temperate Europe. So what I'm going to do, and, and what is important to note about this also, is that fully three quarters of these emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic meaning that the pathogen that causes the disease, that makes us ill, replicates within and is transmitted from some non-human vertebrate, usually a mammal, sometimes a bird, to humans. So fundamentally, these emerging infectious diseases come from nature. They're not things we transmit back and forth between us, uh, at least alone. Most of them come from wild animals. Those zoonotic diseases come largely from wild vertebrates with only a relative few coming from domestic animals. So what I'm going to describe are three of these emerging infectious diseases. These three pathogens shown right here in our research on what causes risk to vary in space and time. So this species right here is Borrelia burgdorferi. That is a spirochete bacterium that causes Lyme disease. This right here, inhabiting that cell, is Babesia microti. That causes babesiosis. It is a protozoan parasite related to the malaria parasite, and it attacks red blood cells. And then this is a bunch, it's a plaque of anaplasma phagocytophilum. This is another bacterial disease. It causes anaplasmosis, and it attacks a type of white blood cell called the granulocyte. Now, all three of these <clears throat> are emerging infectious diseases. They are within that data set that I showed you a few slides ago. All three of them are transmitted solely by the bite of a tick. And in, in the eastern part of, the, of North America, the culprit is the black-legged tick, Ixodes scapularis. So Lyme disease was first, this is the upper panel, or the data on statistics for Lyme disease in the United States. Lyme disease was first discovered in the mid to late 1970s, and in 1982 it became a notifiable disease through the Centers for Disease Control. Um, and numbers of, of cases have grown from a few hundred back in the early to mid 80s to a few tens of thousands in the most recent years for which the CDC has tallied these statistics. But we've known all along that the number of cases that the CDC reports are an underestimate of the actual number of cases of Lyme disease in the U.S. And recently the CDC made an effort to actually quantify to what degree this is an underestimate. And their best estimate right now is that they are only capturing about 10% of the actual number of cases of Lyme disease. So actually, every year in the U.S., there are a few hundred thousand cases, new cases of Lyme disease in our population. And that makes Lyme disease by far the most prevalent vector-borne disease 
in the United States, and the same is true in Canada and most of Europe as well. Babesiosis only became a notifiable disease in 2011, so there aren't very good, there's not a, a long-term national statistic for this, but I got the data from the New York State Department of Health, so these data are only from New York State, and the important point here is the same trend. We're seeing a dramatic rise in the number of babesiosis cases in New York State. And then for anaplasmosis, again, what we see is this, this disease emerged in the United States in the mid-1990s, and we're seeing even more of a dramatic rise, a curve that looks almost exponential in terms of the growth in number of cases. So these tick-borne diseases uh, are a truly vexing problem in the 21st century. As I've just shown you, all three of them are rapidly increasing in incidence. There are no vaccines available for any of these three tick-borne pathogens, nothing to protect us from getting sick once we're exposed. Diagnosis and treatment are highly controversial and remain quite problematic. Healthcare costs for Lyme disease alone have recently been estimated at between $712 million and $1.3 billion per year in the United States. One thing that is uncontroversial that essentially everyone agrees on is that prevention and management of tick populations are fundamental to protecting the public health against these tick-borne diseases. And prevention and managing tick populations and tick infection fundamentally require ecological understanding because it's that ecological understanding that tells us where and when we are most at risk. It tells us where and when we should be avoiding tick habitat and where and when we can intervene to reduce our risk of exposure to these tick-borne diseases. So, as I've said, these tick-borne diseases are transmitted by the bite of a black-legged tick, Ixodes scapularis, and here I'm showing not two, but three, all three of the biting life stages in the life cycle of the tick. Yes, that's one right there. That's the larval tick, the larva, the nymph, and the adult. Each of these stages takes a single blood meal from some animal host that lasts for about three or four days. And after feeding to repletion on that host, the tick drops off and then molts into the next stage. So larva, larval tick takes its three or four day long single blood meal, drops off, molts into a nymph that becomes active the next year. It finds a host, takes another meal that lasts about four days, single blood meal, drops off the host, molts into the adult that feeds a little longer, about a week. Um, and it's the adult stage that reproduces and dies, with this whole life cycle taking two years um, to complete itself. Now it turns out that there are a couple of key features of this life cycle that many people are unaware of but will help you understand about the factors that affect our risk of exposure to tick-borne disease. The first is that these larval ticks hatch free of infection with any of those three tick-borne pathogens. And that is because there is no transovarial transmission of these pathogens from mother ticks to their babies. The, the pathogens stop with the mom, the babies are born without them. Okay, but these larval ticks are what we call extreme host generalists. And they will bite almost any warm-blooded animal that happens to come by close enough for them to grab a hold. Any mammal, any bird, you, your dog, your cat, they're perfectly happy to bite. If that larval tick happens to bite a host that is infected with one of those pathogens, it may acquire that infection in which case it will molt into a, the nymphal stage and be capable of transmitting that infection to whomever it bites at that stage, which could be you or me. So the second important issue is that pathogens are acquired exclusively from vertebrate hosts, and we know from very strong epidemiologic data that nymphs are responsible for transmitting the vast majority of infections to people of all three of these tick-borne pathogens. So when we're interested in trying to describe what our risk of exposure to one of these tick-borne pathogens is, should we venture out into the woods or shrubby thickets or elsewhere where these ticks lurk, we need to know two things. We need to know what's the population density of those nymphal ticks, how many are there? That's a strong determinant of our risk. And we need to know how many of them are infected, what we call infection prevalence. Those are the dangerous ones. The ones that are not infected will not make you sick. So we've been focusing in my lab on determining the role that various animal hosts play 
in influencing both population density and infection prevalence of these um, of ticks with these three tick-borne pathogens. So first, I'm going to address the question, which hosts infect ticks with the three pathogens, or what we call pathogen amplifiers, or what others call reservoirs of infection, competent reservoirs. The way we get at this is we go out into the woods in and around the Cary Institute property, and we trap and net and catch alive and happy every animal we can possibly get our hands on. So I'm just showing you a few of the semi-charismatic uh, ones here. <laughs> so this is a woodchuck up Aww. here. This is a southern flying squirrel. This is a long-tailed weasel, and you all know what that is. OK, so what we do is we, we get everything we can get our hands on. We bring them back into the lab and hold them for three or four days in the lab. That's the length of time it takes for larval ticks to feed and finish feeding and drop off. Okay. We then, at the end of all this, we release these animals back at their point of capture after having stuffed them with really, really good food. <laughs> we house these animals in cages that have a wire mesh bottom, and beneath the wire mesh bottom is a pan onto which things drop, including ticks, but not only ticks. All of those pans. It's a horribly messy job, but somebody's got to do it. So what we do then is we, we collect the ticks that drop off each host animal, and so we know where that tick fed. It was a larval tick, so it started feeding uninfected. If it got infected, we know where it got that pathogen. Okay? So what we do is we collect these replete larvae, engorged larvae, from a known host because the pan was sitting under that host's cage. We then incubate them in the lab for about a month. That's how long it takes for those engorged larvae to molt into the nymphal stage. And then we crush them with great pleasure. And we extract DNA, and we conduct a standard diagnostic test to tell us whether they're infected with one or more of these three tick-borne pathogens. And here are our data for, first, for Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferi. So what I'm showing here is the reservoir competence, where higher bars mean higher probability that the host transmits an infection to one of these larval ticks. Basically what we found is that 92% of the larval ticks that feed on a wild, Millbrook free-ranging, white-footed mouse <laughs> acquire an infection with Lyme disease spirochetes, molt into an infected nymph that's capable of transmitting that pathogen to you or me. There are a couple of other host species that are moderately good reservoirs. There are things like the chipmunk and two species of shrew. Most of these other hosts, like gray squirrels, ground-dwelling birds, skunks, opossums, raccoons, deer, they're terrible reservoirs. They infect ticks with only a tiny, uh, only a tiny fraction of the ticks that feed on them. So what I want to point out is that three of the four most competent reservoirs for the Lyme disease bacterium are the white-footed mouse, the eastern chipmunk, and the short-tailed shrew. And we'll come back to those species repeatedly. OK, so here are the data for Babesia microti, the causative agent for babesiosis. Again, we have huge variation among these different hosts in the probability that they're going to infect a feeding larval tick. What we find is that, once again, we have um, a handful of species that are really good reservoirs, and most are really pathetic. Okay, so again, three of the four most competent reservoirs are the white-footed mouse, the short-tailed shrew, and the eastern chipmunk. Now note here that raccoons are actually infecting a fairly high proportion of ticks with Babesia microti, but I'm now going to gray out that bar and the, the opossum bar because there was a the strain of Babesia microti that we collected in the ticks from raccoons and opossums was genetically distinct from the strain that everyone else contributes, and that genetic strain of Babesia has never been found in a human patient. So we're not sure that they're actually, uh, it's a strain that causes disease in us. And then lastly, for Anaplasma phagocytophilum, again, Lots of variation among hosts, some highly competent reservoirs, and others that are not good at all at infecting these ticks. And once again, the three most competent reservoirs for the agent of anaplasmosis are the white-footed mouse, the eastern chipmunk, and the short-tailed shrew. 
It turns out that hosts also differ very strongly, not only in quality for these pathogens, but also in terms of how readily they feed ticks that are trying to feed on them. So this mouse is a very typical mouse that we catch in about August uh, here at the Cary Institute. All those little blobs that you see right there, you probably know what they are. Those are engorging larval ticks all over the ears of these guys. Okay, so what we've done is we've asked how do several host species differ in their propensity to support tick feeding at all. So this is how well the ticks survive when they're trying to feed on these hosts. Because after all, hosts like you or me groom and they can kill ticks in the process. So what we did was we selected six different species that represent both birds and mammals and a wide variety of body sizes, of, of at least of the mammals. And those six species were white-footed mice, chipmunks, veeries, gray squirrels, opossums, and catbirds. We went out and caught them in August. That's the time of year when larval ticks are most active. And we held them in the lab for about four days until all the ticks that were on them naturally from their experience off in the woods had dropped off. So now they're tick free. We then inoculate them with 100 larval ticks. That may sound like a lot, but to these animals at the Cary Institute grounds, that's nothing. They're not bothered by that at all. And here we are using a paintbrush to put 100 larval ticks on this veery. And then we follow, we, we place them back in their cages, which have wire mesh floors, and we follow the fate of those ticks through time over the next week or so. And there are basically two categories of fate. Either the ticks feed partially or all the way to repletion, and we catch them live, dropping into the pan, or they die in the process of trying because the host groom them off, crushed them, and killed them. And here's what we find. We find that some hosts are really good, they're very permissive to tick feeding, and others are not at all. So 50% of the larval ticks that we placed on these white-footed mice survived that experience, engorged fully with blood, and were caught in the pan underneath the mouse's cage as an engorged larval tick. For veeries, catbirds, and the two other rodents, um, the values were sort of intermediate between about 20 and 25 percent of the ticks survived the experience. Not so good in the case of squirrels. For opossums, only 3.5 percent of the larval ticks placed on a wild tick-free opossum survived that experience. Opossums were killing more than 95 percent of the larval ticks that tried to feed on them. And we've calculated that each individual opossum can kill up to thousands of ticks a week just by hoovering them up and killing them. Um, they don't look like they should be good groomers, but they're smarter than they look. <laughs> okay, so we have described, I have described here a very striking pattern. And the pattern is this. The same group of small mammals are the best reservoirs for all three of these important tick-borne pathogens, and they're the best hosts for ticks. So, you know, that's kind of interesting, but is it important? Well, I'm going to argue and try to convince you that it's actually important in various different ways. I think there are four consequences of this, uh, this pattern that we've described, and I'm going to go through them one at a time. That's going to take up the rest of this talk tonight. The four consequences, just to introduce them to you, I'll flesh them out as I go along. First is the notion that there might be rampant co-infection of ticks with more than one pathogen. Second is the notion that biodiversity loss might influence our risk of exposure to these tick-borne pathogens. Third is that a fluctuating food supply might influence risk changing from year to year. And fourth is the possibility that predators might actually help protect our health. So let me start with co-infection. <coughs> so here the idea is that because these hosts are such good reservoirs for more than one pathogen, it seems likely, at least possible, that an individual larval tick feeding on one of these guys, maybe especially a mouse, might acquire more than one pathogen from its single blood meal, in which case it molds into a nymph that carries two or maybe even three pathogens. And that nymph might be lying in wait, ready to give you two or even three diseases. So what we've done is we've asked the question, to what degree are ticks in Dutchess County multiply infected with more than one of these pathogens? 
And what we've done is we've selected 188 sites scattered throughout Dutchess County. Almost all of these are on private property, and so property owners have been very gracious in giving us access to their property, of course, getting the benefit of having us remove tons and tons of ticks from their property, but I see it as a selfish gesture on their part. And then we analyze those ticks for infection with each of the three pathogens, first singly, and then I'll show you data on the pathogens together. So what we find is across the board, the, 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 the average across all of Dutchess County, we find about 8% of nymphal ticks are infected with uh, anaplasma, and here I'm showing you that these homeowners should be very grateful because we've removed over 4,000 ticks from their various properties. So 8% are infected with anaplasma, 12% are infected with Babesia, and 28% are affected, in, infected with Borrelia, the agent of Lyme disease. So if we want to generate an expectation about how many ticks should be co-infected, having more than one pathogen, uh, based on a, a randomness or based on independent <coughs> transmission. Then if you think about probability, your basic probability class from high school or maybe middle school, if you want to know the probability of two independent events co-occurring, you simply multiply the two probabilities times each other. It's the product of those two probabilities. So for instance, if we want to uh, give a, a hypothesis as to the rate at which we should see co-infections with Babesia and Borrelia if they are transmitted independently of each other, we would simply multiply 12% times 28%, and I did that, and it's 3%. So the expectation based on independent transmission, we should see 3% of ticks co-infected with Babesia and Lyme disease. Well, what do we see? I'm circling the bar that's for Babesia and Borrelia co-infection, and actually we see about twice that ex expectation. And looking across the board, what we find is dramatically higher co-infection probabilities than you would expect if these pathogens were transmitted independently. In the case of Lyme and anaplasma, that's 20% higher than expectations. And in the case of Lyme and Babesia, or a triple infection, Individual ticks with all three pathogens, it's about twice as high as you'd expect based on the assumption of independent transmission. And in fact, we know exactly where these co-infected ticks come from. This is done by collecting ticks from known hosts. Again, an enormous sample size of ticks from a large number of known hosts. This is a busy slide, but I would draw your attention to where all the action is. All these co-infected ticks are coming from small mammals, short-tailed shrews, white-footed mice, mass shrews, and chipmunks. And in fact, if we look at this bar right here, what we're seeing is that 22% of the ticks feeding on a mouse come off co-infected with Babesia and Lyme disease. And if you add up all these bars, you get about 30% of the ticks feeding on a mouse drop off with some combination of two or all three of these pathogens. So those ticks are exceedingly dangerous when it comes to human health. That has strong implications for that has strong implications for uh, health care practice and for public awareness of symptoms and treatments because the treatments and symptoms are different for each of these three tick-borne diseases. So the one consequence of that pattern uh, was rampant co-infection. A second consequence I want to talk to you about is the possibility that there may be increased risk of us getting sick from these tick-borne diseases as we lose biodiversity in the landscape around us. So these three small <coughs> animals share a bunch of life history features in common, um, and we tend to consider them to, be, to have a very fast life history. <clears throat> Basically, they live fast and die young. So essentially, these guys um, we'll just pick on mice for a second. They reach re reproductive maturity at about three to four weeks of age. They then start breeding, and they, their gestation period is about a month. So a seven or eight week old female mouse might have her first litter, and then she gets pregnant almost right away, so that she is both nursing one litter and gestating another, and dropping a new litter about every month until she drops dead, which happens fairly quickly as you might imagine, based on that. 
So they are exceedingly good at filling up the world with more of their own kind, and they become very abundant. Okay, so that characterizes all three of these species. Now it turns out that those very life history features are the same ones that make them highly resilient to human-caused disturbance and biodiversity loss. They thrive in landscapes that we fragment, degrade, pollute, etc. Because those fast-paced life history features allow them to continue to reproduce and fill up the world with more mice and chipmunks, etc. To the extent that that's the case in our this particular study system, what we should then see is when we damage and destroy the landscape, we fragment forests and the like, we're, we will lose some species, but it won't be them. We should see that they dominate in low diversity communities. And the consequence could be very high risk that we're inadvertently increasing our risk of getting sick. So we've actually asked this question empirically. Um, an, another project that took a huge amount of work, we were asking the question, which species remain when biodiversity is lost. And one of the best things, or worst things, depending on your perspective, that we do to reduce biodiversity is to fragment natural habitats, like the forest. So what we did was we chose 40 sites in the tri-state area. Each site was a forest fragment, and they varied in size from less than an acre to uh, a few hundred acres. And we went out and we comprehensively determined how many different species of mammal and ground-dwelling bird these are the hosts for ticks. How many species occur in those fragments? Which species remain when biodiversity is lost as a result of fragmentation? And the way we analyze these data is by creating a matrix. And the matrix looks like this. It's kind of colorful in this case, where each species is a column in this matrix. And each fragment is a row. So the way you read this, for instance, is to see that this column right here is the gray squirrel, and every pixel that lights up in any different color is a fragment in which we detected a gray squirrel. And the same thing for opossums. There are fewer of these pixels, so opossums were detected in fewer fragments than squirrels were. There's one animal that we detected in every single fragment, no matter how small, no matter how trashed, does anyone want to hazard a guess as to what that species might be? It was the white-footed mouse, the only species found in all fragments. And I should point out also that the most diverse fragment, this one that has the most pixels going across, was the largest one. So we're losing species as we chop up the woods into littler and littler bits, but we're not losing them randomly. The ones that survive tend to be the three of the four most ubiquitous species are the white-footed mouse, the chipmunk, and the short-tailed shrew. <coughs> so what this looks like in cartoon form is that when you have a large, extensive plot of forest, you tend to have a full complement of mammal and bird species. As you chop it up into smaller and smaller bits, you lose some species, but not at random. You tend to lose the larger body, more predatory species, and the like. And you tend to get what's left over are the small mammals that are these highly competent reservoirs. So the prediction then would be that these small forest fragments should be the riskiest places in the landscape. They should be places you should avoid like the plague or like the Lyme disease. Because those are the places where we should see the greatest abundance of infected ticks. And indeed, in a paper we published more than 10 years ago, we saw exactly that pattern. What we found was that the density of infected nymphs, this is infected with Lyme disease in this case, was highest in fragments that were less than about two hectares in size. Fragments that were bigger than about three hectares in size generally had a lower abundance of infected ticks and therefore lower risk of us getting exposed to Lyme disease. Now it's of interest that a paper came out just a couple months ago that asked a very similar question, but not at a small spatial scale like Dutchess County, but asked it at an enormous spatial scale of the eastern half of the United States. This was a group at McGill University. And what they did was they compiled data from 1992 and 2011 on the number of Lyme cases per 100,000 population. So this isn't Lyme risk. This is actual incidence in the American population in the, those states. And they wanted to know whether the incidence in uh, those 
those states in the U.S. were correlated with the number of different host species in that state, what we call host species richness. The expectation is that the higher the species richness, based on our work, the lower the Lyme disease incidence should be. And that's, in fact, exactly what they found. What they found was that in states that had very few host species, you tended to get relatively high Lyme disease incidence in people. And in states that had lots and lots of different host species, Lyme disease incidence was low. The pattern existed and was statistically significant in 1992, and it became much stronger by 2011. Okay, so the second consequence, to sum summarize that, is that high biodiversity reduces risk, or the converse is that when we lose biodiversity, risk goes up. And what's going on seems to be that these more diverse animal communities include host species that do one or both of a couple of things. They either go out and hoover up ticks that would otherwise feed on those small mammal reservoirs, and they kill them, and or they fail to infect those ticks that survive because remember, those other hosts are poor reservoirs of infection. Okay, so the third and fourth consequences, and those are the last two, um, have to do with the notion that anything that controls the abundance, the population size of those highly competent reservoirs, those pathogen amplifiers, should affect our health. And there are two general categories of processes or organisms that could affect the abundance of these guys. One is the notion that predators might control their populations by killing them and eating them. So predators would be protecting our health in that case. And the other is the notion that a fluctuating food supply might influence numbers from year to year uh, of these highly competent reservoirs. And that might influence our risk varying from year to year. So what I'm going to do is focus first on food supply and then last I'll turn to predators. And the, this circle is of a particular food supply that I'll be talking about, which happens to be acorns. So our forests here in the Northeast, in much of Eastern North America, are dominated by oak trees. Not everywhere, but in most places. And oak trees are notorious for producing highly variable acorn crops from one year to the next. These acorns are a highly nutritious food source. They're full of lipid, they're full of protein. Um, they have a long shelf life, at least some species do. And so they are an extraordinarily important overwinter food supply for small mammals like these mice, chipmunks as well. There are other organisms that eat them as well. And what one might expect is that when there are highly abundant acorn supplies, these small mammals might survive the winter at a higher rate. They might even reproduce during the winter. They can become couch potatoes. They don't even need to go out and forage for food very often because they store them. And therefore, they're less susceptible to predators. We expect these populations of acorn consumers to be very high after a very abundant acorn year. And in fact, we see enormous variation from one year to the next in acorn production. You can all experience this, I have no doubt. There are some years you go out into the woods or even your lawns there are oak trees above them, and you see tremendous quantities of acorns. They like ball bearings under your feet. And then other years, you can go out and there are essentially no acorns at all. And we've quantified this. These are data that, uh, that Charlie Canham and I have collected at the Cary Institute, where we see some years where there are enormous quantities of acorns produced in the fall, and other years where there are few or almost none at all. So we've asked the question about the, of whether this fluctuating acorn supply might influence the abundance of these important pathogen amplifiers, focusing particularly on white-footed mice. And what we find is that over 20 years that we've been collecting these data, there is a strong and statistically significant correlation between the mean density of acorns produced last fall and the mean density of mice that occur the following summer. So this is a positive correlation. It is statistically significant. After years of heavy acorn production, you tend to see lots and lots of mice. When the acorn crop fails, uh, indicated down here, you tend to see very few mice the following year. Because these mice are such good hosts for ticks, as I've described, 
and there's such competent reservoirs for these tick-borne pathogens, we might further expect that acorns would predict for us the number of infected ticks, but this time two years in advance because of the life cycle of the tick delaying things somewhat. So what, we next, what I'll next show you are data showing a link between the abundance of acorns two years ago and the abundance of infected ticks in the current year. And what we find, again, is a statistically significant positive correlation that when there are lots of acorns produced two years ago, there tend to be more infected nymphs two years later. But there's a fair bit of noise in this data set. There's a lot of scatter. The, the data points don't all fall out along that trend line. And we've been very interested in whether there are other variables, particularly weather variables, that might influence where those data points fall out. Maybe a particularly cold winter interrupts the relationship between acorns, mice, and ticks, or a particularly hot summer. Interestingly, what we found is that winter cold, winter snow cover, summer heat, summer drought, hurricanes that usually happen in the fall, none of those have any impact on the density of infected nymphs at our sites. But there is one weather variable that actually is causing some of these data points to fall off the line. And that is the number of hot, dry days in the spring. So this is February, March, and April, just as the nymphs are getting ready to come out. If we have very droughty conditions in the spring, that can cause a, a drop off in the expected number of nymphs. So in this particular year, we were expecting data up here. We expected the density of infected nymphs to be way up in this high range. What we actually found was a very low density of infected nymphs. And that's because 2012 had the hottest, driest spring in the 20 plus years we've been keeping these records. So this last part argued that we can understand this system of tick-borne illness in a food web context, whereby acorns are driving populations of these pathogen amplifiers, which in turn are driving the abundance and infection of these ticks. But we've gone further than that in placing this in a food web context to ask about other organisms, particularly predators. So this is a very complicated uh, food web. It's a, there are a lot of species that have multiple different interactions, and we're doing our best to try to understand the net effects of this highly complex system. We do that with a low-tech method that my former postdoc and current collaborator, Paul <laughs> Levy, um, calls ye olde cat food can method. So this is the fourth consequence. And this is the regulation of risk by predators. So that thing right there is a can of cat food that Tom nailed to a tree. So that cat food can begins to smell. I mean, initially it smells like cat food, but later it doesn't smell that much like cat food. Um, and it sits there for a, over a month, and we have a, a, a motion-sensitive camera entrained on each of these to detect who visits those cat food food cans, and that tells us which predators occur in a particular patch of the woods. So there's a red fox that is sniffing that delightful odor odoriferous cat food can. So we can determine for each of a large number of forested areas, forest sites, what predators occur there. We also need to know how many of the ticks are infected. That's our metric of risk, our risk of getting infected with a tick-borne illness. And so we go to those same sites, and we collect ticks, bring them back to the lab, and determine how many of them are infected. What's their infection prevalence? This is the nymphs, so the nymphal infection prevalence is our metric of risk. We've done this at two consecutive years at 87 sites scattered throughout Dutchess County. So again, at each site, we are characterizing the predator assemblage, which predator species occur there, and we're looking at tick infection with our three tick-borne pathogens. What we've done is we've analyzed these data by characterizing <clears throat> what we call predator motifs. So of those sites that we sampled, for instance, we have, I can't even see this, 31 sites in which we saw foxes. We, we, we have all these common mesopredators, medium-sized predators, foxes, raccoons, opossums, or bobcats. Another example is we had 45 sites in which there were foxes, 12 in which there were bobcats, and moving down to the bottom, we had 40 
eight sites, it looks like, where there were coyote, but they were apparently excluding foxes and bobcats. So we're characterizing these by these predator motifs. We know that foxes and bobcats are particularly important predators on small mammals. They specialize on small mammals. Um, and they can reach high local population density, especially the foxes. So we think the potential for regulating these animals, these reservoir animals, is very high. We know from our other studies that raccoons and opossums tend to deflect tick meals away from mice. They also do eat some uh, mice and other small rodents. But we think their main effect is by hoovering up ticks and deflecting those tick meals away from the competent reservoirs. And we also know that coyotes do eat some small mammals, but mostly they're focusing on larger prey. So they eat relatively few, and their densities are relatively low. So we think that their impact on small mammals is modest, but they tend to displace these other medium-sized predators by uh, evicting them or actually killing them outright. So as a consequence of that natural history knowledge, we derived an a priori hypothesis about the ways in which these different predator motifs should influence the infection prevalence of ticks with tick-borne pathogens. The prediction was that in communities that have this diverse assemblage of meso-predators, medium-sized predators, we should see lower <coughs> nymphal infection prevalence, the lowest uh, infection prevalence, the lowest risk of our exposure to these tick-borne disease. On the other hand, where coyotes come in and displace those other small mammal predators, we expect to see the highest nymphal infection prevalence. And in fact, our data from these, this large number of sites strongly supports that hypothesis. What I'm showing here is um, the, a regression coefficient. Essentially, any of these points to the left of this vertical line indicate low infection prevalence. And this is with the Lyme disease bacterium. Mm -hmm. Any points that are to the right of this zero line indicate high infection prevalence and high risk. So what we're finding is that indeed, for sites that are occupied by this diverse predator assemblage, or by foxes, or fox or bobcat, we see our health being protected. We see lower than expected infection prevalence. And for sites that have coyotes displacing foxes or fox or bobcat, we see high <coughs> infection prevalence and therefore high risk. For the other two pathogens, Babesia and Anaplasma, we see a similar pattern, not quite as strong. Again, reverse predator assemblages are reducing infection prevalence of these two pathogens in the nymphal ticks. And at least in the case of Anaplasma, where coyotes displace them, we're seeing somewhat elevated risk. So we think we found the weapons of mouse destruction. <laughs> <laughs> they are these predators in your backyard, or if you're lucky, they're in your backyard. So what I want to do is, is wrap up. Um, I know I've thrown a lot of data at you, but I live and die by data, so I can't help myself. <laughs> So I described for you a pattern. The pattern was that small mammals, and especially white-footed mice, are the main amplifiers of multiple tick-borne pathogens. Consequence number one was that we see rampant co-infection of those ticks. And what that means is that we are potentially exposed to more than one illness by a single tick bite. And that's very important for us to know, and for our healthcare practitioners to know, because this tells us a lot about how to diagnose and how best to treat the illnesses that we contract from ticks. Consequence number two was that biodiversity reduces the risk of tick-borne diseases, or conversely, that when we lose biodiversity, we see an increased risk of tick-borne disease. Consequence number three was that acorns turn out to be a good leading indicator of tick-borne disease risk as it fluctuates from one year to the next. Consequence number four, the last one, was that predators can strongly reduce risk um, and thereby protect our health. And I think that this information is not just um, of academic interest. All of these consequences 
can help us avoid the highest risk places and the highest risk times. And they can also help us target the interventions that we're trying to develop to reduce tick populations or reduce tick infection. So I want to close with a couple of current and future research directions fairly quickly. The first one is we're interested in why. What is it about those small mammals that makes them such excellent breeding grounds for these different tick-borne pathogens, bacteria, protozoans, and others? If, if they're highly permissive, their immune systems are not clearing these infections. And if we know what makes them so physiologically permissive to infection, that may help us understand what might make people less permissive to infection. The second current and future <clears throat> research direction is the question of how can we manage landscapes to foster diverse communities of hooks, especially predators. We know very little about this, but I think we need to know quite a bit more because this could help us actually reduce our risk uh, by landscape management, which I think would be desirable. The third thing is we're, we have been focusing on recently and are currently doing is can we vaccinate mice against tick-borne disease? to reduce our risk of exposure. We've worked with two different kinds of vaccines. One of them we're working with right now, including people in the room. And we have strong preliminary results that vaccinating mice can reduce the mouse to tick transmission and therefore reduce the number of ticks that get infected with these pathogens. So we're encouraged that this might be a useful tool in our toolkit. And lastly, we're very interested in how climate warming and changing patterns of climate are affecting tick-borne diseases. So I would like to close by acknowledging a couple of key collaborators. One is Felicia Kiesing, who's a collaborator both in science and in raising children. She's my wife. <laughs> uh, and so she's been involved in all of these different activities that I've told you about this evening. Michelle Hirsch was instrumental in the co-infection part. Tal Levy in the predator part and Charlie Cannon in the acorn part. Kelly Augenfuss and many, many field assistants down through the years, including some in this room, are uh, much appreciated. And then funding has come from a variety of sources. I want to particularly point out that the residents and taxpayers of Dutchess County have been very generous in helping support this research down through the years. So with that, I will end and take some questions. different large trapping grids here on the grounds of the Cary Institute. But uh, recently we worked on a bait vaccine. So you can actually deliver a vaccine in a little oatmeal cookie to the mice. And you can bait a trap, a live trap, with this oatmeal cookie that has a, a, an edible vaccine. The mice have nothing else to eat. They eat the vaccine. And after several doses, they need boosters of this. They're actually immunized. And so that by immunizing them, any ticks that bite them later on fail to acquire an infection and they never become dangerous. So there is a, a company that's interested in uh, developing a product that will allow them to mass distribute a bait vaccine against Lyme disease. There is no bait vaccine against the other tick-borne pathogens, but there's interest in producing one. So the potential for actually using it on a relevant scale exists. Um, I wouldn't go around to the tens of millions of mice in Dutchess County and give them each of <laughs> Yes, ma'am. What is ehrlichiosis? What is ehrlichiosis? Um, unfortunately, a very confusing uh, term. There is a disease caused, uh, called ehrlichiosis. Initially, anaplasmosis, what I've been talking about is one of those three tick-borne diseases, was misidentified as ehrlichiosis. And so the first few years when this disease was emerging, doctors called it ehrlichiosis. They thought there were two kinds, a granulocytic and a monocytic. They attack two different kinds of white blood cells. It turns out that granulocytic ehrlichiosis was not caused by an ehrlichia pathogen. It was caused by an anaplasma pathogen. So they changed the name 
but a lot of people haven't caught up and it's very confusing. So I apologize on their behalf for making that mistake. Uh, we do have a few cases of ehrlichiosis in Dutchess County that's not transmitted by black-legged ticks. It's transmitted by lone star ticks, which is another species that is, occurs here um, and it looks like it's invading from the south. Um, so we may get much more ehrlichiosis in the future, I'm sorry to say. Yes, in the back. Yes, you. I would like some of those oatmeal cookies. <laughs> <laughs> my good question is, if, if my dog can get a vaccine, and you're, even, and you're talking about potentially clearing uh, you know, mice of these pathogens, do you have any knowledge about the potential development of a vaccine for humans? So the question is about a human vaccine, and can we feed humans these oatmeal cookies with a vaccine? Um, um, it's not known, actually, whether these cookies would be effective for humans. But what, what is known is that there was a vaccine, an anti-Lyme disease vaccine, that was available in the late 1990s. It was thoroughly tested. In fact, there were two pharmaceutical companies that were racing to test and license their product. One of them won the race. Um, and it was used for a few years. It was found to be fairly effective, about 70 to 75 percent effective after three shots. So your first shot, another a month later, and a booster a year later. 70, 75 percent is not great, but it's certainly helpful when it comes to the Lyme disease epidemic. Um, but the pharmaceutical company was faced with a class action lawsuit Okay. from patients who thought they were experiencing an autoimmune disorder from the vaccine. Oh. That suit was settled out of court, okay. so it is unknown whether there was actually any medical uh, veracity to the, the claims of the lawsuit, but the company pulled the product and it's no longer available. There is some effort right now to produce another anti-Lyme vaccine, um, but some of us think that probably an anti-tick vaccine would be even more effective because as I've described, these ticks are transmitting more than one pathogen. If you get an anti-Lyme vaccine and suddenly you feel safe, you stop doing your tick checks, you stop using repellent, you get tick bites, you get more sick or more likely to get sick from these other tick-borne diseases. That's a scenario we don't want to see. So there is promise in anti-tick vaccines. You can make a vaccine against proteins in tick saliva, believe it or not, and that would make your body actually attack the tick itself rather than the pathogen inside the tick. Yeah. Um, but there has not been much funding for this, and I'm not sure that there's much vigorous pursuit. I hope there will be because I think it has a lot of problems. Wow. Yes, in the back. Great presentation. Uh, but I missed uh, much mention of white-tailed deer in this equation. So the question is, what about deer, <clears throat> to, to paraphrase? So deer feed um, a fairly large portion of the adult tick population, but not all of them. Um, but as I pointed out in a couple of slides, deer are an incompetent reservoir for Lyme disease and, and also other tick-borne pathogens. So deer do play a role in influencing tick population size, but it's not the very strong role that some of the early studies suggested it took. The, there were a few early studies that took place on small islands. One in particular, a very influential study, a tiny island off the coast of Maine. Um, there was a herd of 100 deer on this island. Um, hunters eradicated that deer herd, so they sent it from 100 to zero in a few years. And there were no other hosts available on that island who could who, who the adult ticks could feed on, raccoons, opossums, skunks, ticks, adult ticks feed on them too. There weren't any on the island, so you destroyed every single one of the only host capable of feeding the adult ticks, and sure enough, you got a crash in the tick population. So people said, aha, it's all about deer, but on the mainland, we have a very different situation. You can't cause the deer herd to go from very high abundance to zero very effectively and ticks can feed on other hosts when the deer herd is produced. So the relationship between deer and ticks in the mainland, which is basically where all the action is, uh, is much weaker. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Jill. 
So, so Jill is pointing out that um, funding levels for tick-borne disease are low, and, and that's, that's absolutely true. Um, it, it's not commensurate with the size of the public health problem, I think it's safe to say. We have an enormous public health problem, um, and oftentimes the, the bigger the public health problem, the greater the level of funding by our various funding agencies. That doesn't appear to be the case with tick-borne disease. I'm not sure exactly why. Um, I, I strongly support the way that federal funding of, of research is done in the United States. We're the envy of the world in the way that we fund research through NSF, the National Science Foundation, NIH. It is, in my opinion, a meritocracy. The best proposals tend to get funded, but politics do get involved. And there's also a, an unfortunate sort of disease of the month club that goes on as well. Whenever some new disease emerges and grabs the headlines, there's a lot of excitement to fund research in that disease. And the ones that have emerged a long time ago, but cause an enormous public health burden, tend to be forgotten and, and underfunded. So I do think that's a problem. I do think funding rates tend to need to increase. I would further point out that ecological research on tick-borne disease is even less funded, less well-funded, because it falls between the cracks. The kind of work that we do is Ecological research. So we go typically it's basic research in natural ecological systems. So we would go to the National Science Foundation to fund it. That's the, the federal agency that funds that kind of work. But the NSF is not interested in human health. That's the role that NIH plays. So NSF will often not be willing to fund um, much tick-borne disease in their portfolio because their sister institution, NIH, is supposed to be the institute that funds human health research. NIH is interested in diagnosis, in treatment, to some degree in prevention, but they're not interested in natural <coughs> ecosystems. They don't really understand them very well because they haven't been trained in that area. So the ecology of infectious disease, which we do a lot of here at the Cary Institute, tends to fall between the cracks and makes it a bigger challenge to get funding. Although we struggle and sometimes succeed, that research that I've talked about has required uh, quite a bit of federal funding. So it can happen, but it's very difficult, highly competitive, and the odds are low. Yes, I wonder if I could just add to that, that um, what also happens is when researchers like Dr. Ostel, and thank goodness he's not close to retirement, but when they do retire, there's nobody to take their place, and that knowledge base is lost. And we can all make a difference by talking to our congressional people. They listen when, you, when they hear the same thing from many of their constituents. Thank you, <coughs> Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, is anything known, or what is known, about the length of time that might elapse from the time that it lands on you, or into the grasses, or the wound, to the time that it finds a nice juicy spot? And, uh, and be effective. Mm -hmm. is, is there some period of time that can be, in which, for example, you could shower and scrub off vigorously and be pretty well safe in that possibility, or any patterns here? So the question is, how long does a tick crawl around once it gets on you? <laughs> how long does it crawl around before it decides where it's going to sink in its mouth parts and drink the blood? <laughs> uh, and there's very little known about that, actually. Uh, I have personal experience with that because I know the time elapsed since I was actually in any place where a tick could have occurred and when I found the tick crawling around on my body and many hours elapsed. Um, so it, I think the best answer is that it varies hugely. There are some ticks that are really hungry or are really aggressive and they'll start to bite within tens of minutes, I would say, would be about the quickest. There are others that will take hours, um, half a day even, before they find just the right spot. Um, and, and they are picky to some degree about where they want to feed. Not hugely so, but there are per certain areas of the body that tend to get tick bites more than other areas. Which they out of reach. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a reason for that. Remember who? I believe you mentioned that August is the worst month for the nymphal ticks. No, I'm sorry. August is, is the worst month for the larval ticks. The nymphs are out right now, so May is typically the worst month. And I think you also mentioned that small fragments are the worst areas for ticks. I don't know what a fragment is or how you decide fragments, 
But my larger question is, based upon information like that, what practical consequences can we draw for where to be and when to be in certain areas and be more concerned about it? Great. Okay, so the question is, what's a fragment, for one thing? I'm sorry for not defining that. Um, and then, given that small fragments are these risky places, as I've shown, um, what can we do with that information? So a fragment is simply, think of, think of a woodlot. It's a, a patch of forest surrounded by non-forest is the best definition. So sometimes there's a little woodlot in the midst of a, a, a farmer, an agricultural field, or a little patch of woods that has a high density suburban development around it. Um, or sometimes it occurs in a wetland, for instance. So these forest fragments are patches of woods surrounded by non woods And sometimes I get the question, and I actually thought this is where you might be going, is, well, let's just chop down all these forest fragments. <laughs> where I was going was, what practical advice right. can you give us yes. other than cutting down forests? So where does it go when and what they Excellent. So, um, so if we can identify where these high densities of infected ticks are crawling around, that's where we can actually intervene to reduce tick populations. There are a variety of different products that vary, but many of them are at least relatively effective at killing ticks. Um, there is a, a naturally occurring fungus, a microscopic fungus that lives here. It's a, it's a native species. There are several, actually. Um, and they've been uh, bred and selected for and marketed, and they're very effective at killing ticks. And they've also been selected to have minimal non-target effects. So <coughs> this fungi won't kill butterflies and spiders and brown beetles, things that we don't want to be killing, bees. Um, so there are chemical insecticides that also uh, are effective at killing ticks. So we have biocontrol agents, we have chemical control agents. There are different chemicals that can be placed onto hosts directly rather than broadcast in the environment. There's a product that, um, to, that, that draws small mammals like mice into a little box. And they walk into the box, and there's a little wick that has fipronil, the, the, the chemical agent in front line. So these mice self-apply front line as they walk in the box to get a little reward at the end of the maze. And it kills the ticks on them. Um, and so you can attract many of the mice in a small neighborhood into that box and kill the ticks on them. You would not be able to do that in a vast expanse of forest. And similarly, there's a, a, a thing called a four-poster, which is a device. It's a huge bin of corn. It has troughs, open troughs on either side, where wildlife can eat the corn. Surrounding these troughs are paint rollers stuck up vertically. There are four of them, hence the name of four-poster. And those paint rollers are impregnated with permethrin, Insecticide. So the deer or other you know, raccoon or opossum stick their face into the trough to eat the corn, and they rub up against the paint roller, that kills the ticks on them, and that can strongly reduce tick populations in that local vicinity. So we do know how to kill ticks. We can't do it over vast areas, but if we know where risk is high, we certainly could target those areas. So the, the question is, what, what would you ask a landscaping company or another company, an exterminator company, that would um, provide the service of killing ticks on your property to find out how effective it is and whether it's killing things you don't want to be killing? Um, you know, the, 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 so the terms in, in the business are, um, they're, they're essentially three. One is efficacy. A second is safety. And a third is um, specificity. And I would ask them about all three of those things and ask them to show you the data or show you the web websites that actually describe um, how effective is their product. If it's a natural product, I'm not convinced that it will be effective. There's some 
that are known to be fairly weak. Um, there are chemical insecticides that are quite potent. Um, there are bio these biopesticides that are also quite potent. Safety becomes the next issue. So some of the chemical pesticides that are potent are not necessarily safe. And that could be either to children or pets, um, or it could be to wildlife or ecosystem processes. And that's something that you should be able to get information on from these companies. And the third thing is specificity. If you're treating your property to kill ticks, are you also nailing all the honeybees who are already having it? heck of a bad time. Are you nailing the butterflies who are pollinating and, and uh, probably don't want to be killing? Um, so I would ask for the data uh, on those three things and see what they're able to, to tell you. I would not be surprised if they balk and say, well, or potentially they might deceive you. I don't know. I, that's why you should see the data so you can judge for yourself. <laughs> Well, I mean, these host-targeted approaches are generally safer because you're not broadcasting the pesticide. These are usually chemical products, but they're not broadcasting to the environment. So they tend to have a lower probability of hitting non-target organisms. Um, and so their safety is generally going to be better, and their specificity doesn't matter as much if you're only delivering it to, to, to hosts. And this biopesticide, this is a fungus is called Metarhizium anisoplea. Um, you can Google that. Um, but it's a it's a product that's been fairly well tested. It is fairly specific. It does kill non-target organisms, but not rampantly. Um, and it is it shows no toxicity to people, and it naturally occurs in our environment. So one more. Uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> You're talking now about various ways that we can reduce the probability of infected ticks in the landscape. But it would seem to me that until we get that nice vaccine that vaccinates against ticks in general, that we all have to be really careful to, to check our own selves, our children, to make sure our families and friends do check every single part of their body every day from the very beginning of the, 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 the season, which is probably March, until the very end of the season, which might be December, because we may have fewer ticks getting on us if we are cautious and pay attention to this and that. But still, unless we're totally indoors, or even if we're indoors, but we have pets, we're still at risk. And, and people are not, I mean, most people probably don't even know, don't even realize how small those nymphs are that they need to be looking for. So this is, I, th I think, more of a comment than a question, and it's one that I agree with. Um, the notion is that it's all well and good to be understanding variation in risk and to be able to target and reduce that risk. Um, but none of this is a substitute for protecting ourselves, and some of the best ways of doing so are to do frequent tick checks whenever we are in or have come out of recently tick habitat, which is almost any especially the forest, but almost any terrestrial habitat. We need to do those tick checks using repellents, especially on shoes and socks. There are a whole list of protective uh, activities we can use, and we need to continue to do those irrespective of what our science is showing us. I couldn't agree more. Great. Well, um, can we thank Rick again for a Uh, if you still have questions, Rick wrote a really wonderful book called The Ecology of a Complex System, Lyme Disease. Uh, it's for sale in the, in the uh, lobby, and, and Rick will sign those if you'd like. Um, it's a great read. I, when I was coming here, I read it, and it's well written. It's got a lot of science in it, but it's very accessible. Um, I also want to point out that you know, what Rick does is actually uh, emblematic of the kind of work that's done at the Cary Institute. People sort of feel that maybe we're off doing our own science, and that's very interesting, and, and, and people are passionate about it, and are driven by the questions they, they ask as scientists. But the Cary Institute, when we say that our, our motto is, you know, the, the science behind environmental solutions, what is remarkable to me is that each of the scientists 
does work that is interesting to them for intellectual reasons, but there's always a relationship between that work and societal questions and how he answers the problems of society. And I think amplifying that, as Rick has done, to help us understand how to be safer, uh, he applies it to his own work. I don't think you've ever had a case of Lyme disease in any of your field stuff. So for, for decades plus, decades, uh, Rick has been doing this work. You'll have noticed in the pictures his socks, trousers are tucked into socks, they're sprayed with repellent. Just because there are tick-borne diseases does not mean you have to avoid the na you know, nature and have a fear of nature. It's that balance between no child left inside and being safe. <laughs> so I'd like to thank Rick for sharing what we do here and doing so well. And thank you all for coming. Come back soon.